Unlike any watchdog that ever existed. Here he comes, and there he goes. Chomps, a world's greatest watchdog. His victims died screaming, but for the one still alive, the worst was yet to come. The Toolbox Murders, a true story. When you stop screaming, you'll start talking about it. the hourglass, so are the days of our lives. Marshall, Will, and Holly, on the routine expedition, met the greatest earthquake ever known. High on the rapids, it struck their tiny raft. the land of the lost. Come on, get out of here. Get out of here. Oh. Come on. Dragon Tales, Dragon Tales, it's almost time for Dragon Tales. Come along, take my hand, let's all go to Dragon Land. the mitt hidden in this picture, then you can win a run through our prize-filled house where what you find is what you keep on Finder's Keepers. And now, here's the host of Finder's Keepers, the man with the hidden talent, Wesley The Finders Keepers, the only show where every room is a rec room. I think everyone had a crush on this man, this guy, when he was growing up when I was growing up in the 70s, um, when we were all growing up in the 70s, you know, rewatching some of his show, Land of the Lost, it took me back in time and brought back so many fun memories. Uh, and of course, he played Dr. Michael William Horton in the legendary soap opera, Days of Our Lives. He's an actor, a singer, a creator, an author, Wesley Yor. Hello. Hey, how are you, <laughs> David? Uh, Jeez, I, I, I'm blushing. I, I feel so admired. <laughs> well, uh, you are. 
Oh, I'm old. I'm old now. <laughs> oh, please, please. I tell you, I can tell everybody when I, I get to be, you know, 80 years old, I want to look exactly like Catherine Hepburn. So. <laughs> <laughs> well, you don't look like her now, for God's sake. <laughs> <laughs> right? Oh, well, you know, I was I was rewatching it, and I just, it sucked me back into a timeline. I mean, starting off with Land of the Lost, because I mean, like I said, everyone that I know had a crush on you. The show was so much fun, and it felt like you know I was watching the intro again today too where you go down the waterfall. And I was going, I remember being in that boat with you. Yes. <laughs> well, you know, we actually, we do these autograph shows, Kathy who played Holly yeah. and, Chaka, and Phil Paley played Chaka. And we bring a big yellow raft and put people in the yellow raft, yellow life jackets, yellow oars, and everybody goes, ah, like we're going over the waterfall. <laughs> that it's, is so, it's so much fun. It's, but it was Marshall, Will, and Holly on a routine expedition met the greatest earthquake ever known. High on the rapids, it struck their tiny raft. Ah, plunged them down a thousand feet below to the land of the lost, to the land of the lost. And then Grumpy the dinosaur goes, roar. <laughs> oh I got to sing that theme song, by the way. That was me singing I the, know. The, the theme songs and the, in, the exit songs. So uh, it was fun, yeah. When we do these shows, <laughs> people go, could you not sing the song anymore? Could you please just not sing that song? No, I want you to sing it every, I want you to put it on my alarm clock so when I wake <laughs> up, I wake up to you singing it. <laughs> uh, oh my God, you know, I, I, I was lucky I was doing, um, I got Days of Our Lives first playing Mike Horton and-, uh, and Oh, then, you got that first? Yeah, and they were both NBC shows. So NBC let me do both series. So for three years, I got to, I got to film all of my scenes on Days of Our Lives in the morning because the cast hated me because I, I went in the morning, got my scenes shot, and then I headed over to Goldwood Studios in the afternoon to film uh, Land of the Lost. So in the morning, I'm crying that my girlfriend is leaving me and that the mafia is after me and I'm having these sexual problems. And in the afternoon, I'm going, run, Holly, run, there's a dinosaur. <laughs> it was, <laughs> I had the best job. I listened. It was it was I had very very heady time for me I must say so it was great having two shows that it's I mean it's amazing and work though I mean that's to you have all those scripts to get into here yeah well you know what it's funny because on you know the soap I I didn't know how when I first started on days of our lives and yeah. um, I didn't know how I'd learn these lines I mean we went to an hour show after the first few months I was on the show and Sometimes I'd have 30 pages of dialogue in one day, 30 pages, 30, count them, 30. And in some days, they should have one page. Yeah. And, but there's, it's like a muscle. It was bizarre. It, you know, I mean, you, you know, you, 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 you teach and you talk about acting and stuff like that. So, you know, but it's, it's, it, it, the more we use that muscle, I could go in in the morning and not read the script in the evening, go into days of our lives, open the script. In the in the morning and and memorize all my lines by run through. Wow. So and not use the cue cards. Wow. And they and in fact I hear Days of Our Lives doesn't use cue cards anymore, so they won't let anybody. <laughs> I mean it's really sleeked down because you know <laughs> they keep cutting and cutting and cutting and cutting because the viewership, of course, on soaps has dwindled because of the internet. Yeah. There's only like I think three three or four soaps left. They're all LA soaps now. Wow. Yeah, I heard that. I the the I watched the soap for a little time. Um, what was it? Um, an, uh, Edge of Night. Uh, I would come home and yeah. watch that, and then of course Days of Our Lives. And um, but how fun! I know I knew that you were doing it. You know, I read where you you did both at the same time, but I didn't know. I mean, you there you were this to me this this young teenager, and then you were a doctor on the other show. Yeah. Well, I, I, I had, it was interesting because I was on days and, and I, uh, David Merritt flew me to New York to star in Candide on Broadway. Mm. And I was going to replace the guy on Candide, in Candide. And I flew to New York and I'd auditioned for, for Land of the Lost. Right. And I was 20, maybe 21. And the, the, I was playing 16 on Land of the Lost. Yeah. I looked young. 
So I got a phone call, said, you got the show. And I go, I don't know if I want to play 16, I'm 21 and stuff. Thank God I said yes. <laughs> I mean, they, listen, it has been it has been the joy. We have more fun. And you know, days were, I mean, Land of the Lost was, it was written by the top sci-fi writers. I Because I know it looks hokey now because it was the 70s, the, the special effects. But the scripts were written by some of the most famous sci-fi writers at the beginning of their careers, like DC Fontana, yeah. uh, 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 David Gerald, who, who wrote Trouble with Triples, he was our head writer. Walter Koenig, who played the original Chekhov, created one of our main characters. I mean, it was crazy. Spin rad. So all these people that later on, you could not have afforded them. But back in the day, they were just beginning. So That's the scripts hold up. The sci-fi is really cool, even to this day. So well, you know uh, that's so interesting. You 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 brought that up because Matthew Payne, one of our students at uh, and one of the actors at Performing Arts Studio uh, West, says, "Do you think that Land of the Lost influenced Jurassic Park?" Absolutely. And, and what, you know, we do these autograph shows, and I, I didn't do them for years and years and years. And then finally, Kathy played Holly. Said, "You know, come on, come on." So, and then we. So the last few years I started to do them and we've had the most remarkable experiences. We had two guys, uh, this, come to, well, this guy come to, come to our table in Los Angeles at a show. He goes, let me tell you something. I thought as a kid, he spoke Farsi <laughs> because he lived in Iraq when it was Iraq. And he said, you were dubbed into Farsi. And he said, my brother and I used to watch Land of the Lost. We became so interested in science. We are now two heads of JPL, Jet Propulsion Lab. So he said, "You want it? We want to give you a private tour of JPL." So Kathy and I went. We actually got to go. It was crazy. They let us in every door that you're not supposed to be in. We went to this one room, and it's huge, and all these computer banks, and nobody there except one lone guy in the corner playing with the joystick, and it's the guy that was flying the Mars, or driving the Mars rovers. Oh wow! And we went into the room where he was. And he said, "You want to drive the Mars rover?" I go, "Yes." Because, you know, I mean, today's the big day. The helicopter flew on Mars. Yeah. So we go we go into this thing and, and he lets us play with the joystick. Now, to be fair, it doesn't actually move it on Mars immediately. Yeah. What they do is they, they program it and it takes eight hours to send the signal the next night and then the Mars rover moves. So, but he just let us play with it. He had a driver's license for every <laughs> rover that had ever been on Mars. But it's amazing how I many people will come to become... Uh, archaeologists and they, they become scientists, sci-fi writers of uh, so many, I mean, just it, it affected a lot of people's lives. And because remember, it was like, you know, in the seventies, you know, it, Saturday morning was for kids. Yeah. It was, there was no, you, you know, when the show aired, that was it. If you missed it, you missed it. You couldn't, there's no taping it or anything like that. So all the kids are sitting in front of the of, of Land of the Lost watching with their bowl of Cheerios or their, you know, Captain Crunch. And it really affected a lot of people, you know, and, and it's amazing. We've had, we've had people come up to our table. I, I remember one, one man, guy, he was in his fifties and he said, listen, he's crying. He's like, he said, I got to tell you, um, I, I know it's going to sound weird, but, but in the, going into the third season, we lost our dad contractual problems, money. And we, we had an uncle come in and he said, you know, my, my dad and my mom are splitting up. Yeah. He said, I didn't think I could handle it. I said, he said, I, I, I didn't know how to do it. But I was watching Land of the Lost and you, your dad left, your uncle came in and the family survived. And he said, I'm gonna tell you, it gave me the strength to understand that life could go on as a little kid, bitty kid. So you never know how, what we do as performers, because we just put it out there in the ethers. We don't think about it, most of yeah. us. And how the, the ripple effect that it can have it's extraordinary. Oh, it more more people tell us stories. That it's are like such that. a good lesson what you just said about that because you know you think about projects that you are either creating and then they get a snag and then you have to move a different way with it and so it makes you think oh maybe it's maybe it, this is the way it's supposed to go or you know suppose is a strange word sometimes but um, Wow, the that's power, the power of the media, you know, we forget sometimes, especially back when there was so limit, there were only three networks. So everybody who was watching TV was, it was probably at least a third of them watching your show, whatever the show was. But, but the power we forget, and it's permanent, if it continues, a land of the loss is still on, uh, it, it, it keeps airing all over these, you know, these, these different stations, we have new viewers all the time. But 
you forget the, the, the effect that it can have uh, long term on people's lives. I've had that happen a lot in my career. And it's been, you know, I, I was one of the creators of Dragon Tales for PBS. Yes. Series. What, that, how did, what, what did that, how did you come up with that? What made you want to do that? Uh, well, I, I had been producing, uh, segment producing and, and, and uh, actually casting myself in a totally <laughs> hidden video for Fox, a hidden camera show. Right, so I right. did that. I would write. I would write the episodes. I would produce the episodes, and I would cast myself. So I got three. I got the biggest check I got was the union, the actors' union. Because the other thing, they just you know, they yeah, you're not a writer, you're a segment producer. Um, and I left to do a musical up in Canada, and the executive producer moved on to Sony. Yeah, I'd written a book that Disney bought for an animated feature, and I wrote the screenplay and the songs for Disney, and it was called. It's called the Red Wings of Christmas, and his son. Max, his favorite book was The Red Wings of Christmas. So Jim Cohen calls me and said, hey, look, I've got this. There's a, a $16 million grant being offered by the government for a new kid's show. The Muppets want it. Sesame Street wants it. Everybody, I've got these dragon drawings. I, can you come help me put this together? And I did. I, I, I finished it up, put it together in three days, and we sold it over the weekend. We beat out everybody, from, from Sesame to you know everybody. And... Um, but it's all because, and, and, and we named the, the, there's a boy and girl in it, and the one of the boys' name is Max, named after Jim's uh, son, and, and Max and Emmy. And I think, I think Jennifer Lopez named her kids after Max and Emmy. Oh, wow. Yeah, back in the day. So I think that's what I'm told. I mean, they're named Max and Emmy, but I'm told that was, was the reason. But yeah, but I'm just saying that ripple effect. I have kids come up to me, especially kids on the spectrum. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and will come up and, and, and can sing every song from the show and know everything about it. And we'll sit and talk for a long time. And uh, it, it's the rip, again, the ripple effect of what you do, you know? So it, it, there's an obligation for all of us as, as writers and directors and producers, actors, whatever, all of us, even behind the makeup, everybody that works on this in this media, I think we sometimes forget the power of the images. Mm. And, and the sounds and and, and, and uh, it, it's nice to be reminded every once in a while well and like you said it how it affects people i mentioned this morning during acting class i popped my head in on another class and just to say hey i'm checking in and i'm interviewing wesley you're today and oh and and one of our students said mark wells said oh my god he's the host of finders keepers <laughs> And it was like, find it. <laughs> <laughs> I, listen, I wanted to be a game show host forever. I still do. And I, I, I did a couple pilots for NBC, one called Pot of Gold back in the day. Uh, but, I, you know, I was, I was a guest star on a lot of games. This is me, me, me. If I, I'll just keep name dropping and just let me know if I've done enough. I but I was it. so lucky. I was like, a, I know, it's like, it's crazy. No, David. <laughs> Sometimes you listen to yourself talking, you go, who the hell do you think you are? <laughs> I'm just kidding. Listen, I was raised in Hattiesburg, Mississippi. My family were, were uh, educators. Yeah. They had nothing to do with entertainment. They thought I was nuts. They really thought. And so, I mean, I, so I, I, I keep, I'm like this kid from Mississippi and I look around and go, how the hell did I get here? I mean, this is crazy. My mom was born in Mississippi. Hattiesburg is where I was raised. She was in Jackson. But That's where my mom was born. So, uh, yeah. Do we but, have the same mom? <laughs> <huh>? <laughs> Brother. Um, oh my gosh. But oh, but but you know, I, I game shows where I, I loved them. I was a regular, pretty pretty much a regular on Password with Alan Ludden, and I did Match Game as as, as a guest star, and uh, I did all the game shows back in the day, yeah. and I loved it. And I finally got my own show on Nickelodeon called Finders Keepers. And it was opposite Double Dare, with Mark Summers hosting. And uh, it was extraordinary. I, we did two seasons and it was just amazing. And I, to this day, I, um, I, you know, and there's nothing more fun because it's, it's like, it's like guerrilla theater. It's live, it's, it's happening and it's real. And there's people winning prizes and money. And I remember I used to play a lot with Elizabeth Montgomery. I, she and I would be paired off a lot, a lot. Okay. And I, in fact, the first, I, I mean, when I first, when I started Password, I was, I was in my early twenties and I thought, okay, I love Passwords and I, you know, I'd watch it. I said, please, please, please don't put me up against Elizabeth Montgomery because she's the toughest player. So I drive into NBC Burbank 
and they give me Johnny Carson's parking spot. My name is on his, where his parking spot from the Tonight Show. I go, oh my god, you know. So I pull in and says Wesley Ewer, and then right next to me go Elizabeth Montgomery. And I go, oh shit, <laughs> oh no. <laughs> so we filmed the first. You know, we shot five days, five shows in a row. You know, for the in one day for for the week. And she was tough. She was a tough, tough, tough one. And they kept pitting us against each other because oh. we like to win. And 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 it, I, I I feel very honored to have. I got to play with Betty White, and I got to teach Lucille Ball how to play password alphabetics for password. They they asked me to teach her. They, they, they came into my dressing room one day. We were, I was about to film five more episodes with somebody. Right. And I think it was uh, Vicki Lawrence, I think, and I were, were doing the show that, that day. Yeah. And they said, Wesley, listen, would you mind teaching Lucille Ball how to play alphabetics, which was the end game of Password. She's played Password when it was black and white, but she, she never played this fast end game. And I said, are you crazy? Lucille Ball, I'll play with Lucille Ball. <laughs> so I hung up the phone and we were in Burbank and my mother lived in Burbank because I had Days of Our Lives was in Burbank. I had a couple of houses there. And I called my mother and said, uh, Mom, what are you doing today? She goes, nothing. I go, want to spend the day with Lucio Ball? <laughs> she goes, yeah. Uh -huh. So 10 minutes, she was at NBC Burbank. And she and my mom sat in my dressing room the whole day. We shot five episodes. I would come and dress. It, it, while Lucy was there, I took my clothes off and put my, my clothes on. And uh, and we'd talk about how the, the game worked and the clues we did and how it all worked. and. And I, I, you know, I, I, I ran into Lucy Arnaz, her daughter, a few, uh, a couple of years ago. She lives here in Palm Springs. Right. And I said, you know, I got to teach your mother how to play alphabetics. She goes, well, you did a good job. <laughs> so, oh, oh, I love that. Now, when you were talking about when you, you were younger, you, like, how young were you when you knew, I've got to get into this? I love acting. Five years old. Really? What was I the stood, I stood up. Yeah. on a table in Mississippi and go, I'm going to be an actor. And then you went, you are creepy. Oh, <laughs> no. But you know what I think it was? I mean, to be to, uh, serious, I mean, my dad left when I was two. He just abandoned us. He was a professor and he left us and never came back. And I think, I, you know, I, listen, I, I think we're attracted to feels that somehow feed a part of us. And I was raised with all women. And I think I, I needed the attention. I needed, I mean, let's just, I mean, just to call it what it is. I think I was starving for some kind of acknowledgement. I think that's part of the reason I really wanted to be an actor. I wanted to be special. I wanted people to want me and stuff. And I found out later in life, my dad used to watch me on Days of Our Lives and brag that I was his son, but he didn't contact me. He never contacted you. I met him, I met him twice. Back at, at the end of my teens, and they passed away. Anyway, it was interesting. Just you know, we all have, listen. We all have our stories. We all have right. our, our ups and downs in, in our family stuff and things like that. But I think that that's part of the reason that that the that was a motivation for this little kid from Mississippi to to want to you know do what I do. What I do. Now, how long did you going back to Mississippi? How long were you in Mississippi before you moved out to Hollywood? Or well, my mother because she got a divorce, she went back to, to get her doctorate degree in psychology. So I lived with my grandmother in Hattiesburg, and then we moved to Denton, Texas, where my mother was a professor at Texas Woman's University for a couple of years. And we moved to Illinois. She was at Southern Illinois University teaching statistics, graduate statistics, counseling. And then we moved to Las Vegas. She was heading up the drug abuse program for the state of Nevada when I was 16. And so I, I spent my high school, in my last year of high school in Nevada, my first year at UNLV, and I met Robert Goulet and Carol Lawrence. I was selling artwork at the, at, at, after school at, at the Desert Inn Hotel, and they needed someone to drive their motor home in New York for, for the summer for the Goober Gross Circuit, the Bob Goulet Show with Carol Lawrence. And I'm 17 years old. And they said, we want you to come. They thought I was funny. And they, they would come to the art gallery. Well, Bob would come to the art gallery and his art gallery though, in the hotel and, his, and David Leland, who was his manager. So they flew me to New York. I'd never been to New York City. I mean, I, I'm just, well, I've, never done, I've never been to a big city like that. Right. And I, I go, and we go to New Jersey, the Garden State Art Festival where Carol was performing. Right. And the first thing they said to me is, Wesley, you're driving Miss Lawrence to New York to her dentist. 
I'm 17. I've never been to New York City. I am now driving Carol Lawrence, who's a major star at this point in her life. Yeah. And I'm 17 years old. And I get her in the back seat with David Leland next to me. And I go through the Lincoln Tunnel. And I am like, I, it's like the Wizard of Oz. I have no idea what is going on. And I drive under the tunnel. I get into Manhattan. And there's all these trucks parked on the street. And I'm going into an intersection. The very first one I come to, I pull out the intersection. I see there's a stoplight over here on the right-hand side, hidden behind the truck. So I back up. And a policeman goes, roll down your window. I'm going, oh, I'm with Carol Lawrence. He goes, young man, do you see the it's a red light? I go, oh, yeah, listen, listen, I, 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 where I come from, the, the lights are in the middle middle of the street, not on the side. There was a truck parking. I couldn't see it. <laughs> and he looked down on the dashboard and said, the Garden State Art Festival. He looked in the bag and goes, oh, hello, Miss Lawrence. Young man, be careful. <laughs> go, okay, I want to be that. I want to be a star. Oh, wow. Is that, yeah, right? <laughs> yeah, so... But uh, what is what is one of your biggest joys in life? Oh my God, my friends. You know, listen, I am so grateful. I, I you know, I, boy, I, I, I feel like I'm just, you know, I'm, I, I'm a lucky guy. Not the luckiest guy, but a lucky guy. And, and I don't take it for granted. I know what I have. And even like the pandemic has been going on. And the fact that I could sit at home, have a nice, comfortable place to stay, have food, have, you know, still work. Um, it, it's, you know, I, I just, I just live in gratitude. I'm just really, I, 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 I get what I got. Right. Yeah. Gosh. Well, well, I tell you, I can't wait to get out to, to Palm Springs one of these days. I, I finally got my hair cut yesterday. Very, oh, very nice. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, I had a ponytail. <laughs> And it's nice and trim on the back. I like that. It's like, yeah, because <laughs> I just did this yesterday with my razor. Did you? I haven't ventured out yet. Did you have your shots? I do. I just got them. I mean, I'm, I'm fully vaccinated now. I'm actually having my first coffee date distancing tomorrow. Yeah. 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 Well, well, you, that listen, speaking of people that have a great life, you have a great life. I mean, look at what you, look at all the stuff, I, you know, I, I, before we, we did this course, I had to go on IMDb and, you know, I have to check, <laughs> you know, but all the things that you've cast and, and been part of, and as, you know, as a performer, and as, a, as, a, as a, you know, uh, the direct, I mean, the whole thing, the, the, the teaching and the directing, everything that you've done in your life, it's extraordinary. I mean, you know, and the fact that you just said to me, oh yeah, well, I just stopped into the, the acting class today, you know, I mean, the fact that the, that it continues that, you know, there's a lot of, we know a lot of people that don't, don't have that, that blessing to that, 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 that things have kept going in their lives. Hmm. It's true. So but you, know, you, you are, you know, you're amazing. You, you're amazing. Thank you. Thank you. Sure. I, you know, I don't, uh, I just don't think about it a lot. I just do it. And I am, I was blessed to come to LA and find a wonderful extended family. Uh, because, of course, you could come to L.A. and get in with the wrong crowd, <laughs> oh, one way or the other. But real people, real loving people. And, and, um, and it's this community, too, which, you know, if you want to, like, dissect it, I mean, uh, it's not necessarily the disability community, but I've, I turned around and my dad had passed. And... Um, and I was, and some of my aunts and uncles had passed and I was going, my family is leaving me and I, 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 don't, I don't know if I'm gonna have any family. And I, I turned around, opened the door of one of my acting classes and Jerry Jewell walks in the room. Mm. And right away we clicked and it was like, oh, my family, you know? So it's, and it's not, you know, people will say, oh, you, it's so nice you work with, actors with disabilities and this and that and I don't I don't see that I see I see Angela I see Jerry I see you know all these wonderful friends so thank you for bringing that up because it's, it's really interesting it's interesting that you gravitated towards that because and why that why that resonated with you did you have a history where there was anybody in your family that was that was had a lot of challenges that maybe that spurred you and gave you some sort of different compassion or different way of looking at stuff um my dad did have a lot of issues. I mean, he had like three hip replacements or I don't know, it was three or five. 
Wow. Bone marrow transplant, this, that, you know, so, so many different issues that we won't go into, but um, I always felt close. I had wonderful parents and I still, my mom's still here. She just turned 95. Wow. So, um, and that's where I'm, that's finally during Thanksgiving after being nine months in the pandemic, I went, you know, I think I'm going to like put stuff in storage and be with mom and my brother for a while. So that's what I did. Probably. But, um, but that got away from your question. Now <laughs> it's like, how, but you, no. it's interesting how you turned and ask me. Oh, but it's interesting, but it is interesting because you do work with uh, people with different challenges uh, in, in that community and stuff. And I, and I, we, we have some mutual friends that are part of that community. And uh, I think it's extraordinary. And it's, it's, I have another friend, Catherine, she's a, a casting in, in the Midwest and she deals with Down syndrome kids a lot and uh, casting and putting them in movies and, and commercials and things like that. And I, first of all, how wonderful that the tide has turned and that they're, that they're finally people have their faces on TV and commercials and stuff. And that it's, it's being celebrated because it's always been a part of our lives. It's, you know, I mean, I'm not to, not to get any, I'm not, not trying to proselytize or anything, but we're very lucky that, that things are moving forward and that, that, that everybody is getting a shot at being a face and being right. seen. All of us, everybody with whatever, whatever's going on in your life. And, uh, you know, I think it's, you know, I'm, I'm hearing what you're saying, too, and all about the inclusion. And I, I think as we move forward, we have that. That's why we're going through such a stage in our uh, this time during this time where there's a lot of trying to bring it back, but trying to move forward. And but uh, the thing is, if it's from the heart and it's it's connecting, uh, it's it's going to get there. Can I ask you, I, I don't know if you can answer this or not, but. Is there one particular performer that that got something that you really worked for that was a surprise that you that, that this a disabled performer made a headway into a role that wasn't necessarily expected to be a disabled was it written as a disabled performer? Has that ever have have has have you ever had that breakthrough? Um, gosh, that's a good question. Um. <laughs> Meet the Miz with Wesley Yuri. No. Uh, I know, I love it. I love it. Um, you know, there's, I, I think of different people. You know, the person that I was really like proud of, you know, I grew up loving the Hoffmans, the Streisands, Peter Sellers. I grew up with all, you know, you know, I had little Hot Wheels that, oh, this is Raquel Welch's car, you know, when I was like five, six years old. As I grew up, my viewpoint changed. And Jamie Brewer from American Horror Story, sure. when I saw that she was in that, I was like, something shifted in me. And I had seen other actors. I mean, I knew that Jerry was, uh, you know, in this show and that show. But again, I didn't think of it, you know, again, in terms of disability. And But to see Jamie Brewer get out there and just nail these and do such a wonderful job and then on Broadway you know I, I got to sit in the second row when she was on that stage and I went there for a week I, I had business plus I got to see three plays and I saw her play twice because I sat there in the second row and there she was the lead of the show and I just bawled because it was such joy so you know, Jerry, Jerry Jewell was the, my first exposure I think uh, uh, watching a disabled performer uh, being cast in a major role. I mean, a recurring role on a major sitcom. And, you know, she's extraordinary. And it, it is amazing how slowly, like even you, Glee, I mean, all that stuff that, that, that we're suddenly, you know, it's about time is all I can say. It's just really about time. Well, I know that one of these days when, when we do open at Performing Arts, they, the, the students would love to like visit with you. Um, I'd love to, yeah. You know, if you're, you know, if you're in town and this and that, but we, because the way they were like going, oh, Wesley Yuri, you know, oh. I mean, there's a hundred students in the, in the class and it's just, it's, it's so. I do a lot, I do a lot of lectures at schools. Do you? I, yeah, a lot. I, the last, before I lectured to 950 kids in a day, uh, a year ago, 
uh, at one of the schools. Um, you know, I, 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 kids have always been a part of my life. I mean, this is <clears throat> Saturday morning show, Dragon Tales. I write kids books. I have kids books out. Disney bought one of them. You know, it's all, I don't, I, you know, I, I think, I, I think I, I definitely have that Peter Pan syndrome for myself. And, um, but it, it's always been important to me. It's just always, I, I, you know, I just relate to it. I, you know, maybe I just relate, but, but it, it, it has been a motivation in my life. And so, so I'm fascinated with, with what you do and the opportunities that you are affording so many people that normally wouldn't have even dreamed of having that opportunity. And I think the dreams I think are so powerful, you know, whether you get the job or not, the role or whatever, but to have that dream and that desire to go for it and know that you can go for it, whether you get it or not. And exactly. that in itself, I think is, the, is an extraordinary, extraordinary experience. Yeah. And there's so many students right now that are just nailing those auditions. And every time, you know, we, we're having more and more auditions at, through Performing Arts Studio West, where I'm so blessed to be working right now. I start, started the, meet, the biz program years ago and then, thank God, I, you know, walked into John Pace's Performing Arts Studio West and said, wow, and became a part of that. I, I went from, I took Meet the Biz all around, to, from Joey Travolta's Inclusion Films and Mary, I mean, it started with Mary Rings of Born to Act Players, but I, you know, again, it's that the family keeps growing and it's, the, the family is humanity. It's this, it's this love of, of each other. Um, and you have so many, I mean, I, it's interesting how many friends that we have in common too. A lot from Roberta Kent to Kathy Buckley to, I mean, tons, tons of mutual friends. Yeah. Yeah. Where did you first meet Roberta? Oh my God. I can't even remember to be honest. I asked Roberta the other day. I mean, she was a stand, she's a stand up comic. She's fabulous. Right. And I can't, I, I can't remember, you know? Yeah, it's interesting when that happens too. It's like you seem like you know somebody for so long. I, I know, I know. And I, I certainly hope I never have to see Roberta Kent again. Because if I ever have to look at her face, <laughs> talk to Roberta Kent again, I think I want to just say that I am over Roberta Kent. I never, ever, ever want to speak to her again. You know, you told me this was going to be Brad Pitt. What's this shit? <laughs> <laughs>